uh, and the other, uh, the other kind of uh, linguistic uh, uh, trope is uh, in Israel, the Palestinians to this day are not called Palestinians, they're called Arabs. And the idea of that, the idea behind that is they belong in the Arab world. They don't belong in a Jewish state. See, and it's, it, these kind of linguistic uh, forms of uh, saying one thing to the world and one thing to your own people is uh, really part of what might be called uh, political pathology. Uh, and it creates a deep misunderstanding of uh, the issues that uh, deserve to be taken uh, seriously. And I should say that, uh, for, uh, speaking for my uh, co-author, Virginia Tilly, uh, a real expert on apartheid, having studied it in the South African context as well, uh, that our whole motivation was uh, how do we find a path to a sustainable peace for both peoples. And our conviction is that unless Israel faces the reality of the apartheid structures used to sub subjugate the Palestinian people and do what the South Africans did, which was to, dis to recognize if they want a peaceful constitutional democracy, the first step is to end the apartheid structure that they had maintained uh, over uh, many years. And they signal that you can't, in other words, you can't have a peace process within an apartheid framework. And, and, and that's the Oslo charade that you, could, that you could indeed find a uh, sustainable peace while expanding the settlements and while uh, maintaining uh, this structure of uh, domination and victimization. And as I tried to indicate in these uh, preliminary remarks, that structure of victimization in a post-colonial global setting is inevitable as soon as you make the state a Jewish state, an ethnic state, because people don't accept that. The pa hard power doesn't control history in the late 20th and 21st century. And that means that a people will, will resist it's not like the colonial era where hard power called the tomb. And it was only after uh, years of sort of consciousness raising that the, the whole ideology of nationalism born in Europe made its way to other parts of the world. But, but the Palestinian national struggle emerged, as I've said, in the twilight of colonialism, and it has continued in a post-colonial historical setting. And what that means, uh, tangibly or concretely, is that the Palestinian people will resist. They'll resist in various ways, sometimes by armed struggle, sometimes uh, and in recent years uh, nonviolently, but they will resist. And, and by, their, uh, by the entitlements of law and morality as it's understood at this time of history, they are, in, they are right to resist. But from the Israeli point of view, they are challenging the established order, and so they must be repressed and 
discredited and defeated. And so you have this uh, interaction and the overlay of the interaction, of course, is our own government that's, that gives a unconditional mandate to Israel to dominate as it sees fit and to expand as it sees fit. Until that mandate is lifted, there will be no peace. And so the imperative is not only Palestinian resistance and struggle, it is our struggle here to end uh, the uh, immoral and destructive policies, destructive for Israel in my view, as well as destructive uh, of the uh, Palestinian uh, reality. Now, what is true of our report, which is different than the way in which apartheid has been uh, discussed uh, within Israel, which is mainly uh, in the context of the occupation, the occupation of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza. And that's where Israelis see, uh, uh, the, the, at least the more, less right-wing Israelis see the alternatives as making peace or imposing, continuing this structure of domination, uh, which one can call it oppression, but it's also because of its uh, racially uh, colored character uh, is uh, better understood to be a form of apartheid. Now what our report does, which is a, uh, both more controversial and in my view uh, more uh, responsive to the actuality of the situation, is to explore whether the policies and practices of Israel toward the Palestinian people as a whole, not just the people living under occupation, but the minority in Israel, the Palestinian minority of 20% in Israel, uh, those that are uh, confined to the uh, am ambiguous status that exists for Palestinians in East Jerusalem, and the uh, cir circumstance of uh, Palestinians in refugee camps both in occupied territories and in neighboring countries. Our premise was that the uh, undertaking of establishing a democratic Israel involved fragmenting the Palestinian people into these various domains, that each of which were controlled and where Jews were put in a position of uh, subjugating Palestinians, that th that, that structure uh, is uh, coterminous with the Palestinian people, not with the occupation. So ending the occupation doesn't solve the problem. See, and that's why we, we would say ending apartheid solves the problem. See, and that's a big difference. And, and sometimes it seemed as if the Palestinian Authority was ready uh, to sacrifice their own people to a great extent by treating the conflict as purely territorial. And therefore, if uh, Israel withdrew to the 1967 borders uh, and did something about at least part of the settlement, uh, then there could be a sustainable peace. Uh, our view, and I think it is the uh, correct understanding, uh, that there can't be a sustainable peace so long as you have uh, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians and their 
children and descendants living in these refugee camps for day. And if, if you visited these refugee camps, you would understand that this is a structure of oppression. It's, it's hard to imagine living in them for a week, much less for a lifetime. And I met someone in the Khan Yunus uh, refugee camp that was fifth generation. You know, and it's hard to, uh, our imaginations cannot grasp what it means to be born, have your whole life uh, in a refugee uh, status. And not only in a refugee status, but in a status where you are, you're subject to a kind of double jeopardy because you're a refugee. You're not treated decently under most conditions. You're treated as something, uh, something inferior or uh, as a threat or as a uh, not allowed to work in uh, normal ways in the place you spend generations, as in uh, Lebanon and uh, to some degree in Jordan as well. So this is a, uh, this notion that you have to address the Palestinian people as a whole and understand that the structures of domination that have been established apply not just to those living under occupation. That is uh, crucial to what uh, we believe was uh, uh, the justification for looking at the, uh, uh, the uh, circumstance in this way. Now the other uh, kind of feature of the report that's important, I think, is to understand that the allegation of apartheid that we made and, and feel that the policies and practices of Israel uh, validate that allegation is an academic report. It's not, it's, it's not a official pronouncement and it's not a judicial opinion. So, and people misunderstand, the same, the same misunderstanding is, tr exists with respect to genocide. People use the terminology uh, sometimes morally as a, a way of castigating treatment of people, sometimes politically as a tactic, uh, and only rarely is it subjected to uh, legal scrutiny by an official institution. And that hasn't happened with respect to apartheid. So what we're saying in effect is uh, this kind of academic analysis by uh, people that uh, are supposedly expert on the subject is a way of saying this is what a court of law should do if it's confronted with this evidence. It's, in, an, in a way you can say it's a prediction of what a court would do if it operates uh, in a responsible, legally responsible way. Uh, and as you may know, uh, the crime of apartheid was embodied in the 1973 Convention on the Prevention, uh, Suppression and Convention uh, of Apartheid. And it was deliberately at that time uh, detached from the South African uh, experience. In other words, to show that apartheid exists, it isn't necessary to show that it resembles what took place the form of racism that took place in South Africa. It's a freestanding ahistorical crime and that's been incorporated by the Rome Statute into the International Criminal Court and is a, uh, apartheid is one, uh, one form of crimes against humanity. And so the, def the, the 
idea of what is apartheid from a legal perspective uh, is uh, at its core uh, the notion of one race dominating another race by relying on what they call inhuman acts for the purpose of sustaining the domination. And the uh, understanding of race is, uh, in this legal setting, is synonymous with ethnicity uh, uh, or uh, what more commonly called nationality. So that fr uh, from this perspective, the same is true in genocide, that uh, Jews and uh, Palestinians are different races. And uh, to the extent that these structures of domination are uh, sustained in order to uh, maintain uh, security and domination, it uh, qualifies as a uh, form of apartheid and the inhuman acts, uh, can, I mean, it's a, our report has quite a long uh, inquiry into that, the, the specifics of that contention. Uh, but you can begin with the idea, what happened in 1948, where the uh, 700,000 or more uh, Palestinians were dispossessed from their land and their villages were destroyed. See, uh, several hundred villi Palestinian villages were bulldozed and they were given no right of return, which is, of course, a, 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 a strange thing in the abstract. You can, uh, people always have the right to return after a war ends to their place of former residence. And of course, uh, the Zionist premise of being a Jewish homeland meant that Jews, regardless of their connection uh, with the land, had an unrestricted right of return, where Palestinians, even with the deepest connection with the land, had no right of return. See, and, and that kind of uh, disparity is again uh, to sustain that disparity in this post-colonial setting requires, necessitates a repressive regime. People are not in the 20th and 21st century ready to submit passively to that kind of uh, denial of their fundamental dignity and identity. Uh, so I think that the essential point here is that uh, the evolution of Israel as a state has intensified its dependence on this apartheid framework of control. And that if we are genuinely and sincerely dedicated to a peaceful future for both peoples, we have to adopt as our slogan, end apartheid. That is the uh, sort of bottom line that I would, that I, that I just came to myself in the course of looking into these questions. And the only other, it, it's not, not enough even to end apartheid. The other thing that uh, sensitive Palestinians from Edward Said to uh, uh, Nadia Hijab have indicated is there must be some Israeli formal acknowledgement of what was done in, to the Palestinians over this period. Uh, As you, as you know, it wasn't entirely satisfactory, but South Africa had a commission of uh, peace and reconciliation. 
which allowed people to come forward and confess and to, uh, d uh, to uh, document what had happened in the past. And it was a kind of mixture of grieving, forgiveness, reconciliation, and uh, some recrimination, some dissatisfaction at the end. But it was that, that need uh, to heal the, to, ad to address the wounds that have been inflicted for so long and are, are still open wounds uh, is again an imperative for those of us that believe that peace is necessary and must be just. The only other thing that I would say in uh, bringing my remarks to an end and uh, making, uh, giving all of you a, a opportunity to ask even hard questions, uh, is that uh, I think it's important to, to at least acknowledge the courage of this young Palestinian that you may have heard of, Ehad uh, Tamimi. <laughs> I'm encouraged that her name is resonant for, the, for so many of you because she represents for me a metaphor of all that has gone wrong. Uh, an innocent young woman, young Palestinian, who saw her uh, cousin shot in the face and had the courage to slap a soldier. And, it, and is now in detention facing a prison term. In, she's been shifted to an Israeli a prison facility which is contrary to international humanitarian law and the Geneva Conventions that children, uh, well actually anyone in the occupied territory, but particularly children under the age of 16 should never be transferred out of their, uh, out of where they were arrested because that cuts them off from their family and, and uh, creates a uh, terrifying experience for someone like that. And now her village has been attacked by settlers in the middle of the night who have uh, put graffiti on the wall saying uh, uh, death, uh, death to Ehad Tamimi and there is no place for Ehad Tamimi in this world. See, and, and th why I think it's such a powerful metaphor is it precisely the Ehad Tamimis who we need in this world? And, and who, who have the power, by their example, to awaken us to our own responsibility to act. See, that's the, it seems to me, uh, the real importance. And, and even though the hard power realities seem to be against the Palestinian uh, uh, aspirations at the present time, it's important to recognize that every struggle of the 21st century by a people for its own liberation and empowerment has been won in the end by the weaker side militarily. That's the unlearned lesson of the colonial period. Uh, that the uh, mobilization of people, and in this case, not only Palestinians, but all of us around the world who stand in solidarity with the Palestinians, we have history on our side. And that doesn't, that's no guarantee. It is a struggle. 
And for instance, the Tibetans probably have lost their uh, struggle. Indig many indigenous peoples have lost their struggle. But by and large, the national movements for liberation have prevailed over great odds and with great suffering over time. And we must keep that sense of being patient with history, but determined to accelerate it. So in that sense, the growing BDS campaign is one way of acting responsibly, and it is one thing that I think projects a responsible, nonviolent vision of transformation and deserves widespread support. And, we <laughs> and as many have noted, the BDS campaign in civil society cannot do the job alone. And, and we do have to see, as in the case of South Africa, uh, that the international community and diplomacy have a role to play. And in that sense, the General Assembly vote on Trump's effort to move, to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, the condemnation of that initiative by a vote of, uh, I think, 125 to 8. Uh, and though every important country, uh, including the closest allies of the US, like France and Britain, and Japan all su supported the condemnation of that move. Uh, and the only, those eight countries, aside from the US and Israel, were tiny Pacific vulnerable countries in Honduras and uh, I think one is maybe El Salvador, two, two Central American uh, uh, countries. In other words, the weight of international public opinion, governmental and in uh, civil society, strongly sides with the Palestinian struggle. And we should strongly side with it. Thank, thank you for your presence and thank you for your enthusiasm.